Game week 27 in Sky Bet League One is done and dusted. It's the past. Let's now focus on delving deep into all of the key moments from the weekend. Let's go. As always, nothing changes. The schedule remains the same. Four selected games for you this evening, delving deep into those. Of course, in the comments down below, give me your thoughts. How are you reacting to your team's performance yesterday? And of course, leave a like and subscribe too on the road to 7,000 subscribers. Let's begin with the first game, Carlisle, as they hosted Oxford United. So it finishes, Carlisle 1, Oxford United 3, the XG 1.19 to exactly 1. A Mark Harris brace, a fantastic strike from Tyler Goodrum, earns Oxford a crucial three points on the road. Let's begin with Carlisle first. The first 30 minutes or so, they looked good. They controlled the game, they had the better chances, but a sloppy goal conceded against the run of play and everything changed. Confidence looks visibly low, as expected when you look at their league position. They are in a a bit of a rut. A squad that has bright sparks and can provide bright moments, but too often when obstacles are put in front of them, they stumble over them. Paul Simpson is under pressure, players are coming in, but in the key moments, only one side took advantage, and that was Oxford United. Touching on them, there's slow starts, and there's that. It was a dreadful start to the game, very sloppy in possession, and a constant chase to win the ball back. Whether the early storm was so significant against the run of play, scoring that goal, it was a game changer. Once that happened, the floodgates opened, and we started to have more of the ball and be much better better when it comes to creative output. One word comes to mind when reflecting on the entire 90 minutes from an Oxford point of view. It was professional. Settle into the game and go from there. You can see when looking at the graph, the slow start from Oxford is visualised clearly, but a goal to kill any Carlisle rhythm is such a defining moment. It was slow at times in the second half, but Oxford, they took their chance early and dictated the proceedings of the match. Goals in key moments, sting your opposition, see the game out in a professional manner. Much easier said than done. We're looking at key players. Firstly, a quick mention to Jamie Cumming, the new number one goalkeeper for Oxford, looked at home in his first game, confident with the ball at his feet, controlled everything that came into his penalty box and one crucial second half save. A very clever piece of recruitment. We had to react effectively to James Beadle being recalled by Brighton and now going to Sheffield Wednesday in the Championship. Jamie Cumming, we looked at him in the summer, I believe. We've gone and done it in the January when we needed to and already, I know it's just one game, he looked very very good and he'll be very disappointed that he didn't get a clean sheet because that performance did deserve a clean sheet on his debut another player mark harris he's been in fine form in recent weeks his work rate was never doubted but the output is back and at significant times too. He accumulated two goals from a total XG of 0.7, a 50% shot to goal conversion rate, 100% successful dribbles and a chance created too. Consistent goal scorers can never be understated in Sky Bet League when we speak about it so often. Players up top scoring consistent numbers when you look at the teams that have been promoted, they've all had consistent number nines that have bad goals at crucial times. If Mark Harris can turn into Oxford's version of that, we are going to be in a very, very good place come the end of the season. Long run, this prolific form of Mark Harris. Next up, Pompey nil, Leighton Orient 3. Then on penalty XG, 0.56 to 1.48. It's one win in seven for Pompey as the slump continues. They're still top of the table for now, but if every team below them wins their game in hand, they could fall to fourth. Very, very damning. Starting off with Portsmouth, have I jinxed this special Pompey team? No, but I think they might have been running hot and we could be seeing the consequences of that now. It wasn't fashionable to say at the time the late winners and last gasp moments weren't sustainable. And let's be honest, they were the real deal. But this rut is really dangerous. Has Mercedes been found out? Is there a title mentality still there? How many additions are needed? We'll discuss all of that. But let me know in the comments down below because that's really, really important. Those are the big question marks at the moment. For Leighton Orient, sometimes we focus too much on the different narrative. We focus all about, in this case, Pompey being dreadful, the slump continuing, the bad form. But Orient were phenomenal, and that's where our focus should lie. The game plan, the execution, the result, it was a perfect afternoon. Every pivotal aspect was done right in every department. The principles and style didn't change. It was fearless, progressive, and robust. It was no smash and grab. It wasn't a case of 11 players behind the ball. They smelt blood. 
when looking at the graph in front of you, it's an unrecognizable look from a Pompey perspective. Nothing like the dominance and control that's been at the heart of all success so far this season. As the stats will show us further in just a moment, Orient was so clinical in the first half, taking advantage of a passive, sloppy and quite lethargic beginning. There was a slight increase in control after the break, but the damage was done. Chances were few and far between, with Orient being simply fantastic at soaking up any pressure. It was, I'll use the word again, unrecognisable. It was nothing like the early stages of the season. The graphs, go back and watch the early roundups with Portsmouth. It was dominance. It would be full of green in this case. Yesterday, it was fairly patchy for large moments. And that graph, well, it visualises that pretty well. When looking at the stats, we speak so much about being as effective as possible with the ball. Understanding limited possession is usual sometimes against a certain opposition, but still finding product from somewhere is important. With only 40% possession in the first half, Leighton Orient had more shots on target than Pompey and converted 60% of them. Excluding the penalty, they created more big chances and ultimately put the game to bed. Of course, from set pieces, they were great as well. It was utterly brilliant all round. It was a showing and display that was perfection in every department. Let's speak about the elephant in the room. Possibly the title, I'm not sure yet, but definitely a question mark. Has the Massinho style been found out? For me, my initial response to that is it's far too early. It's way too early. This could easily just be a blip. Look, a very significant blip and a very, very bad one at a bad time, let's be honest. But I think it's too early. But let's explore it. Crosses have been a crucial part of Pompey's attacking success this season. The use of the wide players and fullbacks have helped this side create 78 big chances this season, the most out of every League One team. But in recent weeks, there has been a drop off. They now sit second for accurate crosses per 90, a metric that only a month ago they sat top of comfortably. Yesterday, they attempted 29 crosses from wide areas, only completing three. That's plan A. Jack Sparks, Paddy Lane, Kamara, whipping balls in to Colby Bishop. Of course, there is a bit more of a complexity to it, but that is the very, very clear direction that Massinho has implemented. That's the plan A, but what's the plan B? Because when that didn't work yesterday, clearly 29 crosses, a 10% conversion rate, it did not work whatsoever. What can you change to? What's the plan B? There wasn't one. Missing a penalty, looking confused in build-up and repeating the same actions that weren't creating clear-cut chances time and time again. It was a dangerous cycle that looked and felt dreadful. We're looking at key players back to giving Orient the credit that they deserve. They put in a performance of that quality against that opposition. If you're going to do that, to a man, you have to be perfection. And you'd say Orient were perfection. One player did stand out though. Orient goalkeeper Solomon Brin. As well as saving the penalty, he accumulated a 100% save success rate, 1.14 XG prevented, and a total of 15 goalkeeping recoveries. The outfield players of Dan Adji and Theo Archibald did their job great, but between the sticks, it would have taken something rather special to beat Brin yesterday afternoon. Final points, the biggest headline. It should be the headline instead of the Pompey crumble, but it won't be, unfortunately. Orient were phenomenal. And that's so important to say, so, so important to say. They and Richie Wellens, everybody a part of that football club, got the game plan well, spot on, in fact. And the execution was just as good. From a Pompey perspective, Tom used two words to describe this recent form. Unrecognisable and unforgivable. Very damning, very telling and some serious character is needed now. Next up, Charlton 1, Peterborough 2, the XG 1.45 to 1.42. It wasn't a goal conceded in the final five minutes this week, but it's another home defeat for Charlton. And that's the biggest disappointment, this time at the hands of your firing and in-form posh. Let's touch on Charlton first. Let's be frank, it's not the ideal fixture when short-term results are required. And for the first 45 minutes of the game, the home side hardly got a kick. Charlton definitely grew into the contest and by the second half started to play with some attacking intent. But a lack of confidence, identity confusion, individual errors, those aspects are going to hold back any footballing side. And so far this season for Michael Appleton and even Dean Holden to an extent, that has been the problem. 
With progression off the pitch with new additions and board communication in the last week or so, the final outcome in this game didn't quite fit the fairy tale. The pressure on Michael Appleton, well, it remains the same. For Peterborough, let's touch on them. Every week, we see a different side to this posh outfit, running right, digging deep, coming back and finding a way. Crucial, crucial traits. Yesterday, it wasn't perfect. We'll touch on that in a bit more detail in just a moment. It wasn't perfect, but it was still a strange blend of everything. It had everything, but not in the perfect performance sense, if that makes sense. It showed lots of different elements. For the first 45 minutes, they looked like the only team on the pitch and with the better finishing being done, this could have been killed off before the opposition even had a shot. It would have been game over by half-time so, so comfortably. It was by no means a perfect display and almost sloppy in moments, but as we approach the business end of the season, season state is so important. Three points on the road and just a single point off top spot with a game in hand, I think they definitely take that. It's fair to say it was one-way traffic in the first half. The stats will show us a bit more of that in a moment. But Charlton couldn't get hold of the game whatsoever. Peterborough, they had their best spell. It was just before half-time. It was always important that we highlight one simple trait and the phrase, score when you're on top. And that's exactly what they did. The top sides finishing in the top positions win games of football when they score when they're on top. They don't rue big chances and big spells within a game of football. Charlton, they got going with 15 minutes on the clock, but the response was far too reactive and too little too late. We're looking at the stats. The graph is one thing, but Charlton's first half stats are dramatically, ludicrously bad. The home side had 34% possession. The home side had 34% of the ball, only successfully completing 156 passes. For context, Posh made 377. Worse still, Michael Appleton's side failed to register a single shot, corner, successful cross or dribble in the first half. That is woeful it is so so bad going forward they did nothing they didn't do anything it was dreadful they might as well have not been there let's touch on the elephant in the room michael appleton what's going wrong with him and his situation at charlton there's pressure there always will be charlton are a very very ambitious football club haven't got it right for a long time but these owners they are ambitious they got Michael Appleton in and so far it hasn't gone well injuries have played a big part I'm not taking anything away from that it is you know a very very bad state of affairs when you look at their medical records so far this season but better players are being recruited and options over time are becoming available but again what is the footballing direction injuries and availability that's, the, that's that, isn't it? That's very, very important. But putting that aside for one moment, what is the footballing direction? Lose to Peter Brafine, but try and create some kind of identity. Long term, that is your only hope. At least with Dean Holden, there was something there, something to work with. But with Michael Appleton so far, you're just not quite sure what's going on. The last 15 minutes was there, but it wasn't there at all in the first 45. It wasn't there in... You know, large bells whatsoever against Oxford the week before. It is just so patchy, so here and there. It just didn't work. It's not consistent within performance. And you can see why there's a lot of frustration. With better players now coming through the door, the excuses will slowly decrease. And that's where Michael Appleton must start seeing results. Things did improve in the second half. I mean, they couldn't have got much worse, could they? And perhaps against a worse opposition, there is a better outcome that comes from this game. On the other hand, though, that first half showing, no side deserves to get anything from that. Better finishing and posh win this game, put the game to bed before they even have a shot. That is awful. It is so damning. So, so damning indeed. When looking at the average positions, it looks like Appleton set up with a 4-4-2, maybe, even that isn't really clear. The wide players couldn't play in behind, being forced to stay deep, isolating all advanced attackers. I think Eden is playing as a left midfielder, not a left wing back. It does look like a straight back four for me. It's bizarre. It's really weird. It's not clear and... Clearly, with the performance and the result, not much was clear. I have put together a fit 11 that I'd go with based on the current available players. I think instead is a better goalkeeper. I've gone with him. You can see it on the screen now. I've gone with him as my goalkeeper between the sticks. My back four, I think, looks well balanced and so much better on the ball. Keep Dobson as a single sweeping pivot. He's much better, I think, 
doing that. You can play now with Coventry a double pivot. I've got Coventry in there. I think it's a very, very good piece of recruitment. He's so composed on the ball. He's very, very technical. He can play as a number eight slash six. I have gone with Harini as an advanced eight, maybe even a number 10 sort of, but keeping that 4-3-3 and that three in midfield. That looks far more balanced as well. Dobson breaking up play. Coventry, a slightly deeper creator. And again, you've got that more advanced option there as well. The front three right now probably does pick itself with the injuries. But again, it should be strong enough. It should be good enough. That 11 is better than most sides in League One. I know this is on paper and confidence plays a huge part. But those new faces already upgrade this outfit a lot. Balance, creativity, pace and Alfie May, they do have the ingredients. Michael Appleton now with new faces, with more players available to him. This is where you've got to start getting results for sure. The final game in real detail, Barnsley 2, Bristol Rovers 1, the XG 1.54 to 1.82. Barnsley make it nine games unbeaten in League One, remaining in the top six simply on goal difference. For Barnsley, it wasn't always smooth sailing, especially in the second half. More on that in just a moment, but against the very tricky opposition under their current management, it's job done. We spoke heavily in the early stages of the season about two things when it came to Barnsley, a lack of attacking identity and the results at Oakwell. All things considered, those aspects are improving. They're now second for goals scored and after yesterday move into the top half of the home league table. Work to be done for sure, but a much brighter direction. For Bristol Rovers, as the graph will show us in just a moment, it was almost a game of two halves. A match that saw Bristol Rovers find their strongest gear the longer the game went on. The harder chances were converted, or the harder chance, should I say, was converted, with so many wasted opportunities that went wayward. Chances that easily defined games, and now, at this point in the season, can also define season. The creativity and general attacking patterns look smart. Once the build-up was completed, the final touch was the letdown purely on performance, They've shown much worse this season. We're looking at the graph in front of you. It's again time for another overused football cliche, but a game of two halves. Barnsley looked strong in the first 45. In fact, 1.27 of their expected goals came before the break. The tide turned as the game progressed. Bristol Rovers grew into the contest and found their attacking gears they'd been missing. It sounds stupidly obvious and not the most analytical piece, but if that intent was shown at any point in the first half, this result could have been so, so different. The proof's there, the proof's in the pudding. You can do it. Just do it over more consistent time and there's a real opportunity for Bristol Rovers under Matt Taylor to give the second half of the season a really good go. When looking at the stats, the stats do show a really tight game over the 90 minutes. Purely looking at it from that perspective over the course of 90 minutes, it was a really tight contest. Fine margins, they made the difference. Sloppiness defensively and clumsy positioning for the second goal is the biggest letdown. Bristol Rovers considered the only two big chances Barnsley had. The home side made hard work of it in the second half, considering the majority of the ball and only having one shot on goal. It was scrappy, or round in build-up, lots of possession being lost. In fact, both sides only completed just over 100 passes each. It was a battle that wasn't always pretty. That's the way I can describe this game, especially after the break. Key players, there's a few. John McAtee has been in fine form this season. No surprise, there's plenty of attention from teams up the football pyramid. Yesterday, he was exceptional once again. It's the work off the ball that's so impressive. If you want to press from the front and play on the shoulder, McAtee is your man. He's such a hard worker and crucial in the way that Neil Collins wants to play. But Liam Roberts, the goalkeeper for Barnsley, kept them in the game at points. The goalkeeper prevented an XG of 1.21 and saved six of the seven shots he faced. So impressive that John McAtee alongside him. Again, I thought Phillips was back to his best. O'Keefe had a great game. Lots of good uh, individuals within this really good Barnsley showing, especially before the halftime whistle. The second half, again, slightly off it, but Rovers, they found their gears and made it more difficult for the home side. But in the end, 2-1 to Barnsley is the final score. And a weekend where goalkeepers are showing their worth plenty across all games. Let's go around the grounds. So around the grounds we go. Barnsley 2, Bristol Rovers 1, Blackpool 2, Exeter 0, Bolton Wanderers and Cheltenham. That game was abandoned for a medical issue in the crowd and it has been confirmed firm this morning Ian the person that did require that medical attention has passed away such a sad sad story and 
Look, nobody should go to the football and not return. All of our thoughts are with his family and friends at what must be a tragically difficult time. So sad, that news. Carlisle 1, Oxford United 3, uh, Charlton 1, Peterborough 2, Northampton 1, Wigan 1, Pompey nil, Leighton Orient 3, Reading Port Vale, that was postponed as well, abandoned should I say because of a pitch invasion against the Reading owners, Shrewsbury nil, Stevenage 1, Wickham 1, Lincoln 1, Cambridge 2, Fleetwood 1 and of course Derby Burton, that's on Sky Sports on Monday night. Thank you very much for watching, I've been Jack, this has been the Jack Wood Football Podcast, please like and subscribe, I'll see you all very very soon, take care.